Um, yeah, so hi everyone. Um, I'm Matt Pritchard. I'm the um, Jasmine Operations Manager. Um, so myself, Ag and Phil will be giving you um, a bit of an update on um, Jasmine as it's been in the last uh, year or so. So um, without further ado, let's uh, move on. So perhaps just a, a quick refresher for those who are less familiar with Jasmine. <coughs> um, uh, Jasmine, let's have a recap of what it's, what it's all about. Um, so it's all about supporting large scale data intensive science, uh, primarily for the NERC and its wider related environmental science community. Um, enabling data analysis at the scales and the performance required by that community and um, providing the resources to do that. So access to the CEDAR archive, bringing data in from elsewhere and sharing that in um, project and community workspaces and providing some flexibility with um, compute uh, capabilities to match uh, what people in those communities need to be able to do. Um, so how do we do that? Um, we provide um, a large scale high performance um, storage and compute, um, more focused on um, storage and compute for, for data analysis rather than pure number, number crunching, I don't know the words, um, compared to a, a supercomputer. And we try and be um, a bit more flexible as a platform than a supercomputer um, and supporting a wider range of workflows and um, at quite a wide range of scales too. Um, so Jasmine is designed, built and operated um, by STFC on behalf of NERC um, with the responsibility for running different parts of Jasmine split between those of us at CEDAR, Centre Environment for Environmental Data Analysis um, within RAL Space and our colleagues in scientific computing and uh, all of us based at RAL, at least um, in theory at the moment. So um, it's always been a bit of a challenge to try and represent Jasmine as a picture. And um, we've, we've tried to um, put together these two diagrams, this one and the following one, um, to try and help explain and, and help you navigate around the system a bit better. So we've color coded the various um, groups of services, as you can see here. So we've got um, information, access, analysis, compute, storage, community cloud, and um, some network components. And um, we'll try and use these colors throughout our talks and we'll try and introduce them in the training materials to help you um, kind of orientate yourselves um, around the system. So here are the, the same components arranged into um, the services, which hopefully um, you'll recognize, although there are some new things too. And uh, this is our kind of context diagram. And um, the idea is that all the technical talks um, uh, that we will have during the, um, the event will use this diagram as a kind of you are here indicator. Um, so perhaps for those of you yeah, less familiar with, with Jasmine, I'll talk you through a few examples. Um, so, for example, um, one particular user story uh, would be that um, using, say, the accounts portal, um, a new user can make themselves an account. And this is like a profile that various privileges can be attached to. Um, you then apply for Jasmine login access to give um, uh, yourself a system account. And that means you can then reach um, various systems on Jasmine via one of the login nodes. Um, you can then get to the interactive compute or scientific analysis, or we call them sci nodes, um, where there's a stack of software, which is shared um, between the interactive compute and the batch compute. Um, and you can also build up a working environment within your home directory, which is stored on some uh, solid state disk storage here. And um, you might also belong to a group workspace, GWS, um, this is something you can apply for through the accounts portal. And then once you've got access to the shared storage, you can share that with your collaborators, your project group. So perhaps once you've developed your own code, tested your own code, you can run it on the, on the batch compute, um, perhaps making use of the, the shared scratch storage um, along the way, um, perhaps because you needed some feature of that particular storage. We'll talk a bit more about that later on. Um, and then uh, if you clean up after yourself, after you've used that shared storage, of course, um, then you can uh, perhaps move the output back to the group workspace to share with your colleagues and collaborators. So that's, that's one example of, of, of a particular user story. If we have a look at another one, 
um, just briefly. Uh, this time we've got um, a user uh, pushing data to Jasmine from an external data source, for example, a model run on a um, supercomputer like Archer via one of the data transfer nodes. Um, if it's a big um, a voluminous data transfer, you might want to use uh, the high performance data transfer nodes here in this special zone of the network. Um, you can push it to what's called the transfer cache, which you can self provision yourself some, some large storage where you can decide uh, what data you want to keep. You might put some of it into the group workspace, um, uh, some of it onto tape, um, and then uh, uh, use the um, storage migration service, the JDMA, to move the data between those different storage media. And then you can uh, do whatever um, compute task uh, you need to analyzing those data that you've brought in. So that's another user story. The third one, um, again, using different bits of the system. So this group, you know, they like they, what they've seen in the managed environment of Jasmine, um, but what they really want to do is build their own um, specialist platform within the um, uh, community cloud. So they've got some resources in an external tenancy here um, using building blocks that we can provide and they can use the cloud portal to administer their portion of this, of this cloud computing um, platform. So it's their tenancy, they can deploy virtual machines and assemble other components for what they need from building blocks that are provided. So that gives you a kind of brief overview of, of um, some of the sort of services and, and uh, what Jasmine looks like. Let's have a look at what happened in, in 2020. Um, well, it's fair to say what, what hasn't happened in 2020. It's been a bit of an odd year, really. Um, we, you, the whole world has had a pretty sort of unprecedented change to what we call normal. Um, we're still adapting to that as the situation evolves. Um, fairly early on, um, back in March, the Cedar and Jasmine teams moved to uh, working remotely, which although we're used to collaborating um, over you know, various um, technologies, um, it did sort of have an effect on, uh, on the way we could work. And it was a still a big change to adapt to. Um, so uh, this significant, um, so yeah, uh, the, the Cedar and Jasmine teams have been working remotely since then. And um, uh, quite a lot of the, um, uh, uh, the scientific computing team's work involves working in um, the machine room um, and uh, some of their tasks involve um, installing new pieces of kit, that kind of thing. Um, and that's been fairly heavily affected by um, the COVID restrictions. So this is our infrastructure manager, Jonathan, fully kitted out in all his PPE, um, ready to do some work in the machine room. Um, and uh, you know, he's, he's listed for us some things here that's how, how it's affected his work. So for any task where his team has to, to work in pairs, so if there's some heavy servers that need to be installed, they can't help but work less than two meters apart. Um, so the visit needs to be planned in advance. Uh, there's very limited time slots, full written risk assessment needed. Um, it's quite hot in there in all this kit. And then there's an A4 checklist of all the um, things he needs to do safely before entering and leaving, even if he needs to nip out to the bathroom halfway through. Um, so it's really affected um, the progress of, of some of the work that, that goes on in the background that perhaps perhaps the users, uh, you users are, are perhaps um, uh, unaware of. So um, really, I think in any other year, um, you know, saying that we kept the lights on would be uh, less of a significant achievement. But I think really this year, um, uh, there's, a, there's a lot of, um, uh, we're, we're very proud of the fact that we've managed to, to keep the operation running. Um, at, at an early stage, it was far from obvious that that was gonna be the case. And so we, we owe a big debt of gratitude to our colleagues in SCD for, for their, their hard work in keeping the lights on. Um, we've made some changes, as we always do, um, and uh, we need to do that to keep up to date with various, um, uh, to, to cope as Jasmine grows, but also to keep the system secure and up to date. And we're going to tell you about some of these in uh, the lightning talks later on this morning, which will then point to uh, some more detailed talks on each topic tomorrow. Um, as well as some of the more visible changes, we've reorganized the way we manage the, the help desk, um, splitting Jasmine from the Cedar Archive help desk, which lets us categorize and um, uh, triage queries in a more efficient way and helps us uh, organize our help documentation at help.jasmine.ac.uk, keep that up to date with the system as a whole. 
We've also launched some new capabilities this year, um, some of them just in time for lockdown to keep frustrated scientists busy. And again, you can hear more about these later in the talks um, that will follow. Um, we've also continued to plan for the future. So we're now in phase seven of our kind of um, ongoing procurement program with um, some purchases planned for this year to refresh and replace older hardware and ready Jasmine for the next few years. And Phil will be talking about that in, um, in his section just following after Ag. So it's been a very challenging and, and busy year for the Jasmine team, and we're very keen to share everything that we've been up to with you. Um, so without further ado, I'll hand over to Ag Stevens, who's going to talk about what's been happening with uh, software and workflows on Jasmine. Thanks. Thank you very much, Matt. Um, just confirm that everyone can hear me. Can I have a thumbs up? Fantastic, thank you. Okay, so I'm just going to talk briefly about workflows and software on Jasmine. Um, and in particular, we're, we're really thinking here, following the kind of user story pattern that Matt was talking about. So um, thinking about how you might want to find and use software on Jasmine, and then how you want to develop your data processing workflows. Um, by the way, I'm Ag Stevens, and I'm the head of partnerships at CEDAR. So coming back to Matt's diagram, this particular um, part of the talk focuses on two areas. So here in the middle, we, we have the compute services section. And so within that, we have the software that's provided on Jasmine. Um, and then we have the batch compute component. So this is, this is essentially Lotus, our batch compute system. And then down the bottom within the storage box, um, we're pointing to various components here. So you might be reading data from the Cedar archive. Um, you might be writing to either the scratch space or group workspaces. Um, and you might even have some software installed in your home directory as well and be using that. So just to take a step back, um, Jasmine is a big data platform. And that means that people are trying to do um, significant amounts of work on it. And if we just have a, a very quick course review of the last 30 years, um, in 1990, as a scientist, you might be um, using some very modern and up-to-date tools such as uh, Microsoft Excel. And, and within a spreadsheet or two, that might be enough to store all the data that you need to worry about and allow you to do some kind of analysis and um, generate some kind of graphs. Moving on 10 years, it's more likely that you'd be moving into using programming languages to um, define your, your workflows, your algorithms, and your processing. Um, and then 10 years ago, it was very common for people to be doing some quite sophisticated data analysis. Um, so it may not have necessarily been on a laptop, but, but typically um, most scientists were probably still using a single machine. And, and typically you write some code and then you run it and you watch it running in front of you. You might leave it overnight, you might leave it running over the weekend, but, but generally it was about setting up a single process and watching it go. So now here we are in 2020 and pretty much most people working within the sort of earth sciences domain um, are dealing with the problem or the joy of big data. And so here we have a nice diagram of Jasmine. Typically, you're looking at building workflows where you have to break up the overall task into loads of little smaller jobs and then have some way of, of orchestrating those across a platform and keeping track of them all and making sure everything worked. So in terms of the user requirements for that kind of big data processing, um, it's worth us just spending a moment to think about you know, what, what the average project that comes to Jasmine might need. So you want access to any software packages that you might need. You want access to a stable and unchanging software environment. And you need that for the duration of the project, but possibly also when you come back later on and need to rerun something. So the idea there is that, that you, want, you want the environment not to change under your feet halfway through the project. You'd like access to unlimited processing capability and you need that at the exact time when you're ready to run because as we know with lots of projects 
um, actually getting the code into a state when it's ready to run can often take half the project or most of the project. Um, so you need access at a certain point that's relevant to you. You need access to unlimited storage potentially, just in case you need it. Again, at the start of a project, it is very hard to exactly um, calculate how much storage you'll need. You might need three times the amount of your final data because you've got temporary files and your processing requires um, duplication along the way. And then it would be really nice to have access for access to tools that allow you to manage those workflows across a platform such as Jasmine. So if we think about how we as the, the facility managers respond to those requirements, um, we need to be able to provide access to software packages. So we do that by providing um, a centrally installed set of packages that are both available on our interactive SI servers and on the Lotus cluster. Um, we now have a system in place, which we'll talk about a bit more in a minute and um, in more detail tomorrow, um, which we call Jaspi. And that's about supporting multiple software environments on a single platform. So not only could we have a Python 2.7 and a Python 3.7 environment, we could also have different versions of Python 3.7 environments um, with different groups of packages at different versions within them. When it comes down to processing capability, we provide a set of interactive servers. Um, but the idea is that you use those to develop your workflows, to, to debug, and, and build your workflows. And actually, whenever you want to do any real work, you then send those off to the Lotus Batch Complete Compute Cluster. In terms of storage, we provision both um, project-specific storage um, in the form of group workspaces, or, or GWS, as we call them. And also, there's a, a significant chunk of scratch disk. And a scratch, there, scratch is there as um, a common piece of disk that you can use for your temporary outputs when you're running your workflows. So you may choose to write some data to scratch um, and then at the end of your workflow, copy it back to the group workspace um, where you're going to keep your final outputs. And in terms of tools to manage workflows, um, we provide some, some of these tools, which I'll mention in a minute. And we also are doing our best to provide um, some best practice guidance on how you go about building workflows. And I'll be giving a, um, a, a talk later on in the um, five common issues session about workflow management. So a really important take home message from this is that, that your workflows should be running on Lotus. Even if you're doing something that is only taking half an hour or an hour to run, it's really, really sensible if you develop it on the interactive nodes over here, but actually when you're gonna run anything for real, run it on the batch compute system, which we call Lotus. And in terms of storage, you're mainly gonna be interested in your group workspaces that you might be interacting with. You might be writing to scratch temporarily. Um, you might also be reading data from the CEDAR archives. You might be processing data that we've catalogued and curated in the CEDAR archive. So in terms of building robust workflows, there are a number of really important things that, that it's worth thinking about. So one of them is which software packages do I need? So in that case, you want to think about whether they are already provided in an environment on Jasmine. Um, is the software installed in an optimal location? Um, I ask this question because there are many different types of disk, as Matt pointed out. Um, so if we go back here, we've got all these different types of storage um, and they perform differently um, with different types of files. So some of them are optimized for small files, um, so, for example, your home directory and small files group workspaces are particularly optimized to manage lots of small files. If your workflow has a lot of small files or if your software is installed somewhere, then it's going to work a lot better on those systems. Can you optimize your tasks for the Jasmine file systems? Um, so that's really the same thing. When, when might you want to use a small files 
optimized system? When do you want to use a standard group workspace? When do you want to use scratch disk? Um, and you can stage your outputs on scratch disk if appropriate. Um, other important things to consider just in terms of managing your disk space, but also as, as a good Jasmine citizen, are you deleting, deleting your temporary files? Are you cleaning up after your processes? If you're processing tens of terabytes, then it's really important that you have something which follows up afterwards and just gets rid of um, anything you no longer need. There are some projects that are working at such a scale that they need to actually stage data onto tape. So we um, have a tape archive available to um, Jasmine users. And in some cases, you may need to actually stage some data onto tape and just pull it back when people need to process it. Um, and a really important thing about robust workflows is, do you have the means to verify that your tasks have completed? And I'll come back to this later on when I'm talking in more detail about workflows. So thinking a bit, a bit more about software on Jasmine, um, there is a talk tomorrow um, in which will go into more detail about the software that we provide and different types of software. Um, one of the key things is we recognize that it's an overhead to manage all your own software. And so where possible, we try and provide Jasmine with a kind of batteries included in pro approach. So on the analysis servers, on the batch servers, you will find a whole range of packages installed in pre-configured pre environments. Um, the, the main environments are called Jaspi down here on the left. Um, and you can see some examples of the kind of packages that we install by default into those environments. Of course, people will also need to do their own thing. So we provide compilers, um, we provide um, advice and tools that will help you build software and, and build your own environment as you need to. We have some software that is restricted in different ways or, or commercial. So we run IDL and users can ha have access to IDL. Um, and we have some software that is only available on certain servers and you may have to register for access to it. An example of that is the Moose client, um, which gives access to the, the mass data store at the Met Office. Um, and of course, there's also a lot of data transfer or data movement software. And we have some really good help pages that, that talk you through the options on that and try and help advise you on the best way to go about data transfer. You got two minutes, Ag. Thank you. Um, so software for workflows, um, you should consider whether you're um, using the pre-installed environment, you can extend those environments. Um, we have advice on building your own environments. And it's really important that you know which environment that you're actually using. So if you want to have a reproducible workflow, you should know that if you're loading, for example, the, the Jaspi environment, um, which one is it actually specifically using. So these are tagged with revision numbers that are the date stamped, and it's important for you to know exactly what that is. We have some workflow management tools. Um, so we have some tools developed by the Met Office and NIWA in New Zealand called Rose and Silk. And if you want to build kind of multi-step workflows. Um, these are really useful. They have a graphical interface and they talk directly to Lotus. So they will run all the jobs on the Lotus cluster. And as part of our Jasmine workshops, um, we have an exercise on that that talks you through how to build a very simple rose and silk workflow. Um, I'm gonna talk later on about this thing called ABC unit. So this is an example framework we have built that's about breaking up a big workflow into manageable, reusable chunks. And I'll give a lot of advice later on about how you can go and how you can construct something like that. You can make it robust and rerunnable. Um, and this is just a good example of how you would do that. And finally, I just want to mention that we've also in the last year launched our Jasmine notebook service. Um, so most people will have heard about Jupyter Notebooks. Um, they are interactive pro programming environments that run in the web browser. And in this case, it's a Python 3 environment. Um, so we've, we've launched the notebook service. 
so that you can do various things on our systems. You can define, edit, and run code in Python. You can access a JASP 3.7, Python 3.7 common software environment. And most important of all, you get access to the CEDAR archive and your group workspace. Um, so if you're interested in finding out more about working with the um, Jasmine notebook service, um, then tune into our um, um, talk about it tomorrow. So I will now hand you over to Phil, who is going to talk through technical developments. Thank you. Phil, you're muted at the moment. Brilliant. Right, that's better, isn't it? Can you hear me? Yep. Good. Okay, thanks. Uh, is that showing the presentation? No. No, it's the wrong thing, sorry. Okay, don't worry. Uh, there we go. Great, okay. So I'm technical manager at CEDA and I'm gonna talk about some of the um, sort of wider technical developments and um, so the direction we're headed in, really, um, with some of the new services that we're building, some of the new services that have come online in the last year. But before I do, I just want to um, have a, a sort of a little bit of diversion. Um, we've got a, a procurement underway at the moment with Jasmine, so for uh, the next phase, and just wanted to point out some headlines about that. We're going to be expanding our storage, um, but also put a ring around it here. Um, we're going to be um, expanding our GPU capability for AI workloads as well. So for the main content of my talk, I want to focus on these three areas. Um, recap um, the kind of Jasmine model, uh, the kind of concept for Jasmine, and then look at that um, in the context of what I've called environments and customization. So Ag was talking about software environments. So I want to talk about a wider sort of environment of the um, surrounding infrastructure that makes up Jasmine and how you're able to customize that for different purposes. And then following on from that, there's a, a sort of consequence to that, which is uh, there are um, things about the way that we do our data access um, that are going to need to evolve and change as Jasmine grows, particularly around using something called object storage. Okay, so at its heart, um, it's about uh, the ability to um, bring your compute and your data together into one place. And as Ag was saying, there's this big data challenge. But I think another uh, really nice dimension that we've seen with Jasmine um, since it started is this element of sharing and, and bringing different groups of people together. So uh, those of you who use Jasmine, you'd be aware that you can um, uh, have a group workspace provisions and um, you can share that space with um, your uh, colleagues or your uh, fellow uh, researchers, but also that data can be uh, incorporated into the CETA data archive as well. So it's kind of like a big sharing environment, which I think is, is really a uh, powerful concept as well. So I think this diagram really shows <laughs> how it's, it's a big challenge, right? Because um, the, conceptually, it's quite simple what we're trying to achieve, but actually in reality, because of um, the technologies we're dealing with, um, budgets, uh, what people are able to learn to use, all the different tools, it gets actually quite complicated and you have to sort of find your way um, through all these different services um, to the best way to do what you need to do. So whether it's a workflow that Ag was talking about or some of the other user stories that uh, Matt was going through. So at its heart, um, you, you probably start with some uh, code um, and it's, you know, it's running perhaps on your computer or maybe on a um, computing system at your uh, home institution. And then that runs in an operating system and to a greater or lesser extent, you can um, customize that. So Ag was talking about having conjure environments, uh, for example, which is really powerful. But I, what I want to talk about is the big sort of greener area around the outside. So if it's running on Jasmine, to what extent can you customize things to achieve what you need to do? And we spend quite a lot of our time 
um, when we have operations meetings internally talking about some of these things because we have users who come to us and they're using different services, um, but they need to do something just a little bit different and uh, to customize it. And so um, what we try to do with Jasmine is make it a flexible environment where we can build different pieces together to allow users to do these specialized cases. So that's what I'm gonna talk about in the next few slides. So if we think about that, uh, the ability to customize, um, some people's first experience of using Jasmine is with these um, analysis um, virtual machines. So it's an interactive one um, where you log in and it's a, a Linux machine and it's shared across all the Jasmine users and it's got um, different software packages installed in it. So that's great, it's a good start. Um, we've got this ability now to do virtual desktops, which really makes it much nicer and flexible, which is good. Um, but also we've got this new capability as well, which we're going to be um, growing over the next few months of allowing users to uh, make their own um, analysis virtual machine. So we're doing that using our community cloud. So the idea is that uh, a group can have an allocation um, of like um, uh, memory and computing power in order to be able to mint or create these virtual machines from the cloud and, and share those um, in that group. So that makes things a lot more flexible and scalable. So the next thing is the Jupyter Notebook service, which Ag mentioned. And a really nice thing about that is that um, when people log in, they get a notebook um, through their browser and actually under, under the, uh, behind the scenes rather, uh, what's happening is that there's actually a, a kind of a virtual computer being made for them, a Docker container. So it's like rather like you have your own computer that's made for you just for that session. So that's a really nice, uh, nice capability. So moving on from that, we've got this um, new thing, which we call cluster as a service. So we've been using that for um, a couple of years now. We've got quite a few groups using it. It builds on top of our cloud environment. And the idea of it is that um, you can um, make um, a custom environment, a custom piece of infrastructure out of some building blocks. So when you start your project, you go to the cloud portal and you go through a series of steps and um, you can pick from a menu of different options. And so you can see these options here on this screenshot. And the one in the, the bottom there, Pangeo, is a good example. It's a, a popular open source um, kind of collaboration and it includes things like um, Jupyter Hub. So it allows you to run your own Jupyter uh, notebook service. And uh, we were talking about some of these capabilities um, yesterday amongst ourselves. And it's, it's rather like with this that you can kind of make your own mini Jasmine uh, from the cloud system. So you can have your own batch computing environment, you can have your own notebook service. So I'm stealing a little bit of the thunder, I think of some of the talks that are coming uh, next. Um, but uh, what I want to do is try and uh, show how they all fit together and, um, and, and help us to build this kind of wider capability of being able to customize Jasmine. So what about data access? We've got a data access problem, unfortunately, and um, it's really to do with our cloud computing um, environment, but there are other issues as well, which I'll show in the next slide. Um, but what we're trying to do to address it is use um, a new kind of storage, object store, um, increasingly throughout, uh, throughout Jasmine. And we've got some um, early uses of it, um, which I'll say a little bit about. So if somebody's using our cloud environment, they're, they're using the kind of the green box over in the right hand side with a purple background there. And if they want to access the, uh, the data, the storage, if they're using like a regular interface with like a file path and using the commands you're familiar with like CD and LS and all those kind of things, you can't actually access it from our cloud system. So the access model that we have is you can be thought of as being a bit limiting in a way you're fixed to um, being able to access it if you've got a Jasmine ID and pretty much unless you can SSH in, you can't really see that data. Um, with object store, it's very different. Um, the access model is through HTTP. So as you would do through a browser or through web services, if you're familiar with that from programming. So it means that basically you can expose the data potentially um, anywhere in the world. But importantly for us, in our case, you can access it from our Jasmine cloud system. 
So there are big changes and Neil's talk is going to talk, I think, more about this kind of thing. What, what does it mean to use Object Store? How do you uh, integrate your applications with it? Um, but fortunately, um, there's quite a lot of work going on in this space. And um, for example, in the Earth observation community, there's something called cloud optimized geotiffs, which is a special kind of um, format of uh, data that works really well with Object Store. And in the climate community, there are tools like X-Array and Czar um, for putting NetCDF data onto Object Store and also our own project S3 NetCDF Python. So there's some work we can take advantage of there. We've got quite a few early adopters using Object Store on uh, Jasmine. And there's one of them that I just want to pick out um, at the end, uh, DEFRA JNCC. And they're working with um, satellite data. And if we look at our um, overview diagram again, it's using the object store at the bottom. It's labeled as the HPOS and the sort of cloudy shaped icon and using our cloud environment as well. So how does it all fit together? We've got this workflow moving from uh, left to right. So they've got some satellite products coming in, Sentinel-1 and Sentinel-2, and they're processing them using the uh, Lotus batch compute environment. So nothing unusual there. They're outputting it to regular storage um, in a group workspace. But then what they're going to be doing, and this is work that's um, underway at the moment, is they're going to write it out into Object Store um, using X-Array and Czar and write it into this format so that it can be used with a special open data cube software, which allows you to um, access the data, all these different satellite pro um, products as if they're like a huge cube, a multi-dimensional cube in the spatial and time dimension. But what's really nice from Jasmine's point of view is that we can provide our cluster as a service system. So here they, they get pretty much out of the box their own um, notebook service, which they can deploy um, into the cloud, but they can customize that to integrate it together with the open data cube so that people can go into the notebook and then access the data cube from that notebook. Two minutes, um, Phil. Okay, thanks. So where next with the object store? Um, we're going to be looking at improving access and performance and improving management tools as well. So you can um, better manage access to it and access rules for users uh, so to restrict or make the data open. There's also some pilots we're doing as well to look at um, best um, storage formats, um, because this is quite a challenge at the moment, particularly around, I would say, net CDF data. What's the best approach for us to take and what, what's the community out there doing? So, yeah, I've recapped on the, the Jasmine core concepts and um, said how this is going to be delivered in terms of the services and how you can customize things in Jasmine. So this customization element is an area in which we've got quite a few new services which we've developed recently over the, you know, the last couple of years. And uh, just to say that it's got consequences for us um, moving forward where we're seeking to use Object Store more extensively. And I think this is going to ripple outwards. It's not just for specialized applications with cloud, it's something that we're going to be looking to use more extensively across all of Jasmine for all kinds of use cases. That's me done. Thank you.